In Hanscom AFB, Massachusetts, which is located in Lexington, this is the inn on base, and I had to stay there for about a week. The room that I stayed in had a bedroom as well as a living room. The night that stands out to me is one where I was sitting on the bedroom on the bed, and I had just gotten done sending a text. I put my phone on the nightstand and started to get comfy. As I was laying on my side, I felt paralyzed. I couldn't move my body. I'm not sure how else to explain it. I felt a heavy presence in the room, starting from the doorway to the side of the bed I was on. I felt the bed sink in. No joke, I literally felt it sink in as if a human being was sitting on my bedside. And I saw a Caucasian woman that looked to be about in her 50s wearing a black dress with a white embroidered collar. Her hair was put up really nicely, almost fancy. She wore a hat that sat high on her head and was square on top, almost like a graduation cap. She sat with her back facing me, but slowly turned her head, allowing me to see only her profile. Her presence was so unbelievably powerful and heavy. I've encountered other presences in my life, and this one was within the top three of feeling whatever evil is. I don't know why, but I remembered feeling like she wanted me to know that she was in charge or something of that sort. I felt like I couldn't breathe, couldn't move or scream. When her presence left, I didn't see her get up from the bed. I immediately shot up, turned all the lights on and went to the living room area to stay awake for the rest of the night. This is one of two locations on Hanscom AFB that I've experienced spirits. When I was six years old, we visited the Queen Mary. My mom, my two brothers and I went with a tour group on a beautiful sunny day. Everything that happened to me that day, I remember vividly. Unfortunately, my mom and my brothers saw nothing remotely frightening or paranormal, as I did. My older brother said I constantly gripping his arm tightly, bothering him because I got terrified multiple times throughout the walkthrough. Recently, all at a dinner, we talked about that day and of course I heard a million times as I was driving my brothers nuts and the time I turned into a big room, turned white and ran right out. I cried and was inconsolable. Anyways, I told them that the tour was terrifying and asked how could I be the only one scared. I reminded them of the area we all walked, through, walked through in a line and we walked by all these sailors bleeding and the nurses running around trying to help them. The white outfits with the red blood was so vivid and one guy was clearly dead from his wounds. I told them I had to bury my face in my brother's arm because I was scared and the faces distorted with fear and pain and urgency and how I badly wanted to get out of there. Well, you can imagine their faces as they explained that never happened and was in no way part of the tour. I reminded them the head of the beds were against the wall and they were like, evenly spaced and all the beds looked identical. The part that I remember running away from was this big room with thick carpets and was really big like a ballroom or something. And we walked in, it was a bigger entrance and I was holding my mom's hand. We walked in and there was a lady standing with her right arm and shoulder facing me as I walked straight in. She had her hair up in a bun I guess, like Victorian or Edwardian kind of updo. Her hair was brown, like light ash brown and she was Caucasian. Her dress wasn't as old fashioned, it just looked like maybe turn of the century with a fabric modestly covered up to her neck and was long sleeved but it was tighter around the torso but puffed out slightly at the hips with slightly poofy shoulders and long sleeved dark maroon coloured dress. I know I'm probably doing a horrible job describing the fashion, I apologise sincerely. Anyways, and she looked like she was anticipating someone or waiting anxiously and heard my shoes kind of squeak on the thick carpet. Her initial expression was as if she expected someone she wanted to see coming through the entrance. Unfortunately for me, and her I guess, it was just me. She looked at me with the coldest, angriest eyes I've ever seen. Not only did I seem to offend her, but even disgust her. I got the distinct impression as she glared that I was not welcome and also 
I, for the first time, felt that my skin colour was being judged. I almost didn't want to include this part, as it was a first for me to feel this type of racial animosity, so it's slightly a personal experience. I know it sounds, well, insane, because it was clearly a ghost, but she came from a different era and she exuded a high class kind of air about her. Perhaps seeing me and my six year old girl, early 90s outfits with the ponytail on the side of my head, probably was the craziest thing she had ever seen. Anyways, yeah, I ran out and was super scared. I thought she would hit me if I came back in. Well, as you can imagine, my family had no idea what I was talking about and swore that the tour had no reenactments or anything like that. My brother did state that I had other instances like that. As an adult now, I've watched various different YouTubes on the Queen Mary, specifically videos supposed hauntings, like Buzzfeed videos or the cheesy ghost hunting channels, etc. I have yet to come across any story describing similarity to my personal experiences. I always hear about a boiler room ghost. I didn't see that part of the boat on the tour, so it's completely irrelevant to me. Hopefully someone else can let me know if they too have experienced this. I'm reaching out and hoping to find others who in their lives have experienced similar experiences. When I was eight, female, and my brother was nine, we moved with my mom to a very small town after my parents split up. The new house was two stories with three bedrooms and a den. There was a large bedroom on the main floor with a full bathroom and a small den at the front of the house. The master was upstairs along with another room that was entirely purple, paint, carpet, drapes. So my brother immediately claimed the big room on the main floor with the bathroom and I was stuck in the purple nightmare. When we were moving in, we noticed a lock on the door to my brother's room, but it was odd because it locked from the outside with a key. We eventually found the key in the cellar. My mom just brushed it off. The room also only had one window, close to the ceiling, that was long but not wide and didn't open. So it let in light, but you couldn't really see out unless you stood on something. The other two bedrooms both had regular locks on the doors that locked from the inside. There was an attic at the top of the stairs that also had a lock on the outside, so we didn't think too much of it. We all went to bed that first night, and I don't remember anything too off myself, just new house strangeness. My brother the next morning said the light in his bathroom was flickering, water running, toilet flushing, and he was a bit freaked out. My mom checked the room and everything seemed fine in daylight. He decided to stick it out. We explored the house that day, found the key to the door and odd leftovers from previous people in the cellar and attic. The attic was right beside my room and I was a bit spooked by it, but I'm sure that was just me being eight. The next night after we all went to bed, I woke up to my brother screaming at the top of his voice, mom, help me, please stop, help, from downstairs. I got there first because my room was closest, but my mom was right behind me. He was in his bed thrashing and looked like he was basically having a fit. When I got closer to his bed, he literally jumped out of it crying and staring at his bed. He said he felt something on his chest holding him down and what felt like thumbs being pressed into his eyes and a voice whispering, die out, die out, die out in his ear. We couldn't see anything in the room, but my brother was adamant that he was not going to stay there. My mom was trying to cheer him up and said he could sleep in her room. My brother and I were halfway up the stairs, which were across from the room, and he asked her to please shut the door. I've never seen him so spooked. She laughed and said okay, and went back to close the door and even made a joke about being able to lock the door now and did just that. As she started up the stairs towards us, we heard a loud knocking on the door coming from the inside. Needless to say, my brother and I screamed bloody murder and ran for my mom's bedroom with her close behind. He moved into the small den the next day. He just couldn't sleep in there, so we turned it into a rec room and had our couch and TV in there instead. He had no issues in there. We never slept in that room, but anyone that came to stay with us said they would be woken by activity in the bathroom 
or catch glimpses of something, but no one ever felt what my brother did, thankfully. We only lived there for one and a half years. It's been 30 years now, and I've always wondered who or what was kept locked in that room, and why. I live in Singapore, and it's the Hungry Ghost Month again. It's like the Day of the Dead in Mexico, but with more joysticks and hell money. However, after my experience five years ago, I never leave my blinds open at night anymore. To those unaware, the Hungry Ghost Festival happens during the seventh month of the lunar calendar, and lasts for 14 days in East Asian countries. Essentially, Taoist and Buddhist followers burn paper money, hell money, joss sticks and food offerings to pray to their ancestors. These offerings also appease the hungry ghosts, spirits with insatiable hunger that haunt the streets. As Singapore is a multiracial and multi-religious society, locals are taught about the festival as children. There are three simple rules. Don't step on any joss sticks or paper money. Never touch the offerings. And don't go out late at night. Naturally, I abide by the rules and have a front row seat to the festival. I understand its religious importance and honestly don't hate it. Every year, offerings are left along pathways near homes and paper money is burned in metal bins late at night. Yellow embers light the ground with smoke, trailing up to meet my window. I live in an apartment close to the ground floor and am within earshot of the chants and prayers. One late night, I couldn't sleep too well and hung out with my elder sister and her cat in the living room. The night was deathly quiet and peaceful. At some point, I realized I could smell smoke in the living room and figured the window must have been left ajar. From this room, the window looks down on the offerings of the ground floor. The curtain was slightly open. I snuck over to the window and peeped outside. It was midnight, the metal bin was still burning and it gave the ground floor an unearthly glow. As I closed the window, I heard something crunching below me. I figured it was a neighborhood cat, but was met with something large crouching under my window. From my vantage point, I could see someone kneeling at the offerings. They had long black hair draping a white dirty smock. They bowed over a spot with many offerings, and I thought they were in deep prayer, but it was odd since it was pretty late already. The crunching noises were growing louder originating from the messy black hair. My realization made my knuckles turn white. I was rooted in fear. This wasn't a person. They had no shadow in the light of the joss sticks and were actively eating the offerings, hungrily, as if they were starved for years. My elder sister saw me petrified and called out to me, whispering if I was okay. I looked at her, my words shivering as I breathed. Someone is eating the offerings. The moment my voice rang out, something felt wrong. The crunching had stopped. I looked back to see the figure standing straight, stiff as a board. As I turned around, I locked the window and shut the curtains. I huddled beside my sister. She sensed something was off too. All was quiet until the growling started. We looked over to the front door to see our pet cat growling. Protective of my elder sister, her furry coat and tail puffed up and she looked unbelievably angry. My sister and I didn't move for an hour as the front door shook outside. I could hear a woman laughing softly at the door. I know I fucked up and had never told the rest of my family about the incident. If my cat wasn't at the door, I believe that thing could have tried to attack me. As my cat no longer lives with us, I became very diligent and made sure every goddamn window is covered and locked by sundown. Before I start this story, it's important for me to clarify that the paranormal here in the United States isn't the scene the same as it is in Mexico, from where my father's from and from who I heard this story. Here, at least from my experience, it's seen as nothing more than a cool and sometimes taboo subject to be into, and sometimes people consider it to be a sort of hobby. In Mexico, on the other hand, 
it's seen from a much different point of view. It's part of our culture. The same stories our great grandparents heard are the same ones that are passed down to us. La Llorana, Duendes, Nahuales, Brujas, and even the devil himself. We're taught to treat these things with respect and to never take them lightly. To us, it's much more than just witnessing an old chair move on a blurry security cam, or maybe hearing footsteps in an empty room. It's part of our culture. My father is not the type of man to seek attention. He's a humble, honest, hard-working man, and as a result, I wholeheartedly believe him. Since he could remember he had the misfortune of being more sensitive to the paranormal than most. What I mean by this is that all throughout his life he has found himself face to face with most of the stories we're warned about. Even now, as a grown man, our entire family has grown accustomed to experiencing more than our fair share. It's almost as if this stuff, sort of stuff follows not only him around, but us too. This particular story takes place in Mexico when he was maybe eight or nine. He was accompanying his grandfather, who at the time worked as a watchman at one of his friend's stores. This specific store also functioned as a warehouse, similar to stores like Costco or Sam's Club, but on a much smaller scale. But they go era, for those who are wondering. It was around 11 o'clock when they arrived, well past sunset and into the night. My great-grandfather and his friend had struck a deal, and whenever he was on his shifts, he would help himself to anything he wanted to eat, as long as he kept a list in order to make sure it wasn't marked down as stolen inventory. As they were getting ready for the night, my dad was told that he could choose anything he wanted to eat. My dad was excited to hear this, as it wasn't often that he was given the opportunity to choose anything from the store that wasn't a necessity without having to worry about having enough to pay for it. He wanted to make sure he made the most of this opportunity and decided to go around the store looking for what he wanted the most. He finally made up his mind and settled on a bottle of chocolate milk. He started to make his way around the store and eventually found himself wandering the halls in search of the refrigerator aisle. After figuring out it was in the very back of the store, he hurriedly rushed towards the low buzzing hum of the dozens of refrigerators. After running past the aisles and suddenly turning onto the very last aisle, all he remembers was an indescribable feeling of not only pure terror and true fear, but also an endless sense of despair. As he turned the corner, he was face to face with a tall, thin man. My father tells me this man had to have been at least two meters tall. His initial reaction was to try and run away from him, but he couldn't. It was more than being just paralyzed with fear. He felt an endless empty pit inside him as well as around him. He doesn't remember the face of that man and he doesn't know how much time passed. He had lost his sense of where he was and at the time could not for the life of him tell anything except the fact that it was him and the man in front of him. He does remember, however, that this man was ni neatly groomed and seemed very well kept. Despite not remembering his face, he does recall that he was staring straight at him. He doesn't remember what happened after. He only remembers coming to his senses on the floor in his grandfather's arms, being questioned about what had happened. His face was full of tears. All he could manage to choke out was that the man was there over and over. My grandfather's first thought was that someone had broken in and he rushed my father back to the front of the store where the only lockable room was located, the owner's office. He told my father to wait inside the office and no matter what, to open the door for anyone. He would be back as soon as he checked the store to make sure it was safe, but the memory of the man was still all too fresh in my father's mind and he decided he'd rather brave running into the main again and his grandfather by his side rather than remain alone inside the store. Despite his grandfather believing it wasn't safe, he could see the terror in my father's eyes and complied with his wish. After checking through each and every corridor and deciding that the store was safe, they both headed back to the office, where my dad explained everything. For the most part, it seemed to be an isolated incident, as my great-grandfather later that morning told the owner what had happened and he claimed it was the first he had heard of anything of the sort happening inside the store. It is worth noting, however, that the store was torn down not two months later after this incident, and the owner seemed to give no more of an explanation other than he was losing money. 
Despite my dad not daring to outright say what he thinks he saw that night, it's more than apparent to me that based on his description of both the man and the feelings that overcame him, I think it's safe to assume that the man he saw was none other than the devil. The demolition of the store does nothing but further fuel the theory as to what it was my father saw that night. My whole life, I've always had paranormal experiences and unexplainable things happen to me. But I've always had what I believe to be a spirit follow me. There are three of them. Today, I'm going to talk about Emma. As a kid, I named all three spirits so I could decipher who is who. They all look different. Emma has long dark hair, a dirty white vintage dress, very bruised looking skin, and her hair is always in front of her face. Almost exactly like the grudge. I see her daily, and she even shows up in broad daylight with people around. Usually when I see her, it's only for a second. Once I blink or look away, she's gone. I rarely catch her moving, though I have seen her move before. One of the main times I caught her moving was when I was with my sister's family, and I looked over and caught Emma quickly moving towards me with a knife. It was only for a short second and I blinked. She was gone. Ironically, it was in the hallway at a time when no one would have seen it themselves. Even though she usually doesn't allow people to see her, I've had a few occurrences where a family member or friend will explain to her exactly to me without me telling them. For as long as I can remember, Emma had been following me around and I've moved houses about four times since I was young. As I've gotten older, she scares me less and less and she doesn't appear as often as she used to, but I still feel her presence. I feel as though the less scared I am of her, the more she detaches from me. I feel like this is because she's feeding off of my fear, but I'm not entirely sure. I've been trying for years to get them to go away, but everything was unsuccessful. If anyone knows what she may be, please let me know. I need help. A new house we moved into when I was 11 was normal enough and the neighbourhood was a step up from our last. It was ready to accept us, everything emptied and clean, all except for the shed in the back. After we moved in, my dad wanted to move our gardening tools from the garage to the shed, but the shed was occupied. Every wall had sloppily built shelves and each shelf was packed with all sorts of different containers. Gatorade bottles, milk jugs, mason jars, Sunny D, and every kind of cheap water gallon brand you can think of. All of them were filled with water and every single container was written on. I'm fluent in English and Spanish, but this was different. It was an indigenous dialect from Mexico. Similar to Nahuatl's, but my mother knows a little and claimed that it wasn't that, but it was similar. Either way, we needed to move our stuff in and the water had to go. I dumped them while my dad moved things in and that was that. But that night I had trouble sleeping. We had power but no cable and this was before we even bothered with internet at the time, dial up days. I had the Star Wars movies on DVD and it was on the background while I played with my Game Boy. My TV was next to the doorway to my room which made it a dark hallway look pitch black. It was a little past 2am when I heard what I thought was my mom or dad in the hallway. I thought that because the footsteps were adult, too heavy to be my sister who was six at the time. The footsteps stopped at my doorway. I wasn't afraid because we were still unpacking and we'd been looking for this or that all day. Still, I looked at the door. From hip level, a bottle was tossed into my room. I know the difference between a fall and a toss. It was tossed. Still, I was unafraid. Why would I be? It was my mom or my dad trying to get me to turn off my TV and go to sleep, right? I called out once, twice. By the third, I was terrified. My parents, my parents teased me sometimes, sure, but this wasn't in their gambit of tricks. I got up and went to their room. When I saw them sleeping and heard those noises, the sound of your breathing when you're asleep, noises that make that you can't mimic because you're not conscious while making them, the ones only your loved ones know. 
I shook my dad lightly and told him what had happened. We went into my room and found a Gatorade bottle filled with water with the same scribbles on it. I slept on my parents' floor for a few nights. There's a whole host of other mildly terrifying things that happened in that house, but I can't explain someone throwing a bottle that we'd apparently missed out of the pitch dark. That happened. I saw it. There's no convincing me otherwise. It was either some paranormal shit, or someone had been watching and knew exactly how to scare the fuck out of me and broke in to do it. The other concrete memory is one that still gives me goosebumps as I write it out now. It was a school night. I remember because I had to miss school because of sleep loss the next day. I was doing homework and I heard a faint sound coming from a small vent cover in my room. I couldn't make out what it was but I got on all fours to listen. It was women, maybe half a dozen of them, chanting, praying, praying what I later learned to be Hail Mary in Spanish over and over and over again, in that weird trance-like tone people do when they pray in unison. I later learned that this is a drone of the dead in Hispanic Catholic practices. I was so petrified, I couldn't really articulate to my mother why I needed her attention, but I could see that I was deathly serious. I told her to be quiet and listen, and I could tell that the noise caught her attention the way it got me. Soon, she was kneeling next to my vent cover listening, completely silent. What fucks with me to this day is the expression on my mother's face. The metamorphosis from confusion and curiosity to horror and disbelief was too much. See, I told you, I said in a tone louder than any sound I'd made in the last five minutes. Then I heard what sounded like about half a dozen women saying shh all at once. We immediately got up to get my dad, but we were frantic with our explanation. All he understood was that there were intruders in the garage. He grabbed a shotgun and raced to the garage, which was only accessible through the driveway or backyard. The vents we were listening to shared a wall with it. I watched from the living room window. There was nothing, no TV, no radio, and no women. The vent didn't lead anywhere else and there wasn't any TV in the house playing anything like that. I heard them. I heard the prayer before I even learned it in a church. Other people have said that the shh may have been a hissing from something in the vent, an animal maybe, or a piece of faulty equipment. No, it sounded like six women saying shh in different tones of voice. That happened. No one can tell me otherwise. I heard it. And all the other mildly little terrifying things, I can explain away. But I saw that bottle thrown, and I heard those women. I went out pigging with one of my best mates all the time. But this one time, the dogs lose their shit and go jump off the back, so we stop and let them loose, and they shoot off like they're on a trail of something beside a really tall dam bank. So we think we're onto some pigs. We were standing there and could hear their bells off in the distance, getting further away. Then, nothing. The bush was silent and we started to get a bit unnerved. We felt okay because we both were holding loaded guns, but it was still an uneasy feeling. We stood listening for about 10 or 15 minutes and couldn't hear a thing. It was almost suffocating. So my mate started calling his dogs in. He's calling for a good 15 minutes and we still hear nothing. So he says, fuck this, we're going looking for them. As he turned to the car, we hear the bells come from behind us in the tree line which we thought was weird because it was in the opposite direction to which the dogs had left. So we turned around listening and my mate starts calling out to them to come and from behind us, us comes the dogs, without their bells. Needless to say, we both ship bricks and throw them on the car and bail to the other side of the place. The whole time the bells were still jingling like something had them on. Weird thing was that we were a good 400 kilometers from the closest civilization. So we shit absolute bricks and we're uneasy for the rest of the night. Anyone else experienced anything like this? When I was young, I lived in quite a small town in Queensland. The whole town was surrounded by bush in every direction for hundreds of kilometers and we had so much room to play. 
This particular story is about the first time we got drunk. In the winter, the level of water would drop significantly. Enough for us to camp in the riverbed. My best mate's parents owned a pub at the time, so we were in charge of getting the drinks for a little camping trip we had planned, so we could finally pop our drunk cherry. The place we had in mind was out near an old indigenous settlement, where a few creepy things have happened to us over time. So we made our way down into the riverbank, which was low on the side we came in, and really high on the other side. You couldn't see on the other side through all of the trees on the top, and it was kind of unnerving knowing someone could be up there watching, and you wouldn't know. There were about seven of us kids in the camp, and our parents had no idea where we are or what we're doing. We lied and said we were staying at a friend's place. We set up our camp and built a little shelter for all of us to sleep under. We're all set up and start drinking as the sun is setting. Soon, it's dark and we're in full swing mixing drinks and singing songs and throwing stuff in the water and generally making a whole heap of noise. As we're starting to wind down, one of my friends saying he saw something move at the top of the riverbank on the steep side. We all say that he is full of shit and should calm down but he's adamant there's someone up there so we all start calling out, come out you pussy and other such things, being brave well beyond our years. To our surprise, a bearded man wearing straggly clothes and no shoes comes out of the tree line, stands on the edge of the bank and just stares at us. We all go silent waiting for him to do something, but for about five minutes he just stands there and then he retreats back into the tree line. We all talk amongst ourselves and get a bit nervous, but we soon forget it. About an hour later, the guy is back, but he isn't on the bank anymore. He's coming out of the shadows from the other side of the bank and entering our camp. He comes over and stands next to the fire. Just joins our group of 12 year old kids and stands there. We're all officially a bit scared and don't really know what to do. So we just sit there in silence. Eventually, one of my friends gets up the courage to speak to him. G'day mate, how are you? Are you okay? The guy just stares at my friend and then starts staring at each of us in turn for a little bit of time, spent on each of us. My friend tries again. Hey, are you okay? What's your name? The man snaps his head back at my friend and stares at him wide-eyed for at least two minutes before answering. Without blinking, he says in a raspy whisper, that's none of your fucking business. And he hisses like a cat. Then this guy just jumps back, screaming and staring at the fire like it had just appeared and runs off up the steep bank in record time. It was impossible to get up this thing, so we all stand there speechless. We decided that it's best if we just stoke the fire up because it's about 19 kilometers walk in the pitch black back to town and we weren't confident of that. So stoke the fire we did. We sat up for as long as we could, keep watching, not really talking. We all eventually dozed off one by one. When we woke up in the morning, everything was gone. All our alcohol, all our bags, all of our shoes and all of our blankets, everything. The creepy thing was that none of us awoke as someone robbed us blind and there was not a single footprint. We were sleeping in a wettish sand so there should have been footprints everywhere, but there were none. It looked like we hadn't even been there. Needless to say, we bailed and ran most of the way back to town. Our feet were all cut up and messy by the time we got back. We never told our parents about our camping trip and I don't think we ever will. The indigenous people of Australia have up to 75 different dialects, depending on the region where they come from. So the name of this could be called something entirely different in the other dialects, but my local tribe called it the Kadachiman. Growing up in an outback town, you get a lot of freedom you take for granted, but that freedom could also get you into trouble, big trouble. This occurred when I was about 11 years old in my hometown. My Aboriginal friend and I were walking around town bored out of our brains during school holidays. The rest of our friends had gone away for the holidays. So we decided to go fishing in a secret spot down by the old Aboriginal encampment, where they were mived after their occupation of their land in our area, which was about 15 kilometers out of town. 
We headed around the butchery to pick up some meats for yabbies, to this house for rods and traps, and then my house for food, drinks and a shovel. We planned to dig for worms out by the river. We got all the necessary supplies and headed out along the side of the highway. We were walking and talking and stuffing around when we finally got there. We headed down the sand road and came across the fence that blocked off the sacred land. There was a statue of some sort on the boundary and my mate stopped and said a few words. He always said that his dad told him to do it, otherwise the bad spirits could see us. I told him that was silly and skipped it. We go down the back of the camp and walk on another kilometre or so and find our spot. All the noises of the bush were there and there was a nice breeze blowing through the old ghost gums. We could see the fish jumping and knew we were in for a good day. We start digging around the worms and come up with a few big good ones and get to fishing. The day gets on and it turns out that we're terrible fishermen with rods, so we abandon them and get in the water to catch with our hands. Turns out I'm also terrible at that, but my mate ends up catching a decent sized yellow belly, so we keep it for eating and showing off. We hadn't kept an eye on the time and before we knew it, the sun had set. My friend starts getting really nervous, saying that it's time to get out of there and we really need to leave. I ask why, and he says that it's really unsafe to be there after dark. I laugh, and at that exact moment, there's a huge splash in the water behind us. We both shit a little, but with our child bravery, we check it out and can't see a thing. Just ripples on top of the water. We dismiss it as a big fish and start to pack up our stuff to leave. By the time we start our march back, it's pitch black. We can barely see our hands in front of us and forgot to pack a torch, so we kind of fumble our way through the bush until our eyes adjusted. We're walking for about 20 minutes when we stop. We can hear heavy footsteps off to our left, about 15 meters away. We strain our hearing and the footsteps stop. We then realize that the bush is silence, no wind, nothing. Our eyes have adjusted to the dark so we can kind of see where we're going and we realize we've overshot the road by about half a kilometer and whatever was making the footsteps was between us and the road. So we decided to push on and come out along the highway further up the road. That was a mistake. The footsteps kept persisting, sometimes closer and sometimes further away. I swear at times I could hear low mumbling. I kept saying to my friend, but he told me to shut up and don't look back. If it can't see us, was what he kept saying. So I push on, my feeling getting more and more uneasy. The next second, we hear a loud crash come from our left on the small animal trail we're on, and my mate grabs me and pulls me off into the scrub and tells me to lay down. As we're laying there, we see a silhouette loom up to the path. It kind of has the outline of feathers on it, and is in godly tall and humanoid but sickly thin. It's going from tree to tree, not very far from us, and it's looking all around, snapping its head and making a low mumbling sound as it moves. It was looking for us. It keeps moving around where we were standing and suddenly stops and stoops, looking back to the path where we hear what we could have been a kangaroo jump off into the bush. The being lets out an unearthly scream that hurts our ears and shoots off down the path faster than anything I've ever seen. I look to my mate and whisper to him, if he had just seen what I had, but when I looked, he had his head in his hands the whole time. He answered, we're not allowed to look. His cheeks were all tear stained and then he whispered, I told you he would see you. We waited for what felt like two hours and bailed out of the bushes and ran the remaining distance to town, losing our fish along the way and some of our stuff. We finally made it and every time I tried to bring it up with him, he told me to shut my mouth or it would come back. So I eventually stopped trying. I haven't been able to sleep right since.